Hi, everyone. For those of you who know me, my name is Alan Blake. For those of you who don't, hello, welcome. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me here today. I want to talk about something that um, I hope you will find interesting, because after doing some of the research with this, it was uh, pretty cool. I'm not going to go through any slides or anything like that. We've got 10 minutes to kind of whiz through this, but my information is all going to be at the bottom here of each of these slides, so Twitter, email, etc., etc. So I'm going to talk about the five faces of uh, public Wi-Fi, and I'm also going to touch on the captive portals as well. So one of the things that we need to do when we're doing uh, Wi-Fi designs and we have a customer that asks us to install guest Wi-Fi for their customers as well, we've got an obligation and a duty to make sure we install the correct solution. Sometimes we put in some really, really awful captive portals, or we see some really, really awful captive portals, like right here in this hotel, yeah? Awesome Wi-Fi experience in this hotel? Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, so I did a little bit of a blog on this, and I've kind of did a bit of a twist on this about taking off our Wi-Fi hatch just for the minute and just be that user. So I just want to base this on your own personal user experience. What do you want to see when you connect to a Wi-Fi network? How good do you want your experience to be? So put together something. So I don't know if you can actually see, but just excuse the, uh, <laughs> the picture there. We've got a bit of an angry customer. Okay, It's not a very, very good experience. And the reason why it's not a very, very good experience is because there's a captive portal getting in the way of accessing the internet. And this particular captive portal is charging the customer. So we don't want to pay for Wi-Fi, do we? Does anyone want to pay for Wi-Fi? No, come on. So why do we, well, why do we see that? I, I have no idea. I mean, the business model is completely flawed. You know, we need to start trying to convince customers that their own customers don't want to pay for free Wi-Fi, for Wi-Fi access. It needs to be free. It drives the customers away as well. So you know, how many people, hand on heart, may come back to this hotel? based on their Wi-Fi experience. Hands up. So if the hotel's listening, so then here we have a bit of a <laughs> slightly improved Keith. You know, he's getting better. He's not as angry. He's not the demon that he once was. This time, we've got a captive portal here that is, I suppose, asking us to register our information this time. OK, so we're going to use either a username or password that they give us at the reception, like here in the hotel. Or they're going to give us, or we're going to have to put in our own information, such as you know, password uh, for emails, or we're going to have to create our own account, so you're going to give them your personal details, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there could be some restrictions on this particular um, <coughs> Wi-Fi service, such as data caps or restricted speed, and they might even offer you an alternative solution that you have to even pay for. So they'll give you something for free, but it's basic, it's simple. But then on the other hand, they'll give you something that says, well, we'll give you, I don't know, six meg faster speed, but you're going to have to pay for it or we'll give you 20, mega, 20 gig of data, but you're going to have to pay for it. It's not what we want. But it keeps getting better, OK? This time, we've got a moderate user experience, because we've still got the captive port solution. You know, It's that barrier to get onto the internet that we want to avoid, we want to remove completely. But this time, it's slightly easier. You know, We're logging in using our social media, or we're using our phone number. OK? So we're not having to enter any of our personal details. We're not having to sell our soul to the devil, or anything like this. So those are kind of captive portal experiences that um, I personally feel exactly the same on the screen. But we get a smile from Keith, OK? It's improving. Our customer experience is improving because there's no captive portal in this particular scenario. This time, the customers enter a password, so a pre-shared key. And they go into the coffee house. They'll purchase a coffee, a donut, and they'll get given the password. They'll enter, <coughs> they'll enter the password in and they're on the network. OK, much, much better experience than the dreaded captive portal, right? And then finally, the elated Keith. This is what he w I want to see. <coughs> the connect and go, the fast reopen, easy Wi-Fi. No captive portal, no pre-shared key. Yeah, that's what we all want as users. Connect and go, no fuss. Yeah? No? <laughs> you don't want to access the internet with minimal fuss. You would prefer to enter your details into a captive portal. OK. <laughs> We're coming to that. That's a good point. Just bear with me. We're just talking from the user's perspective right now, OK? Question. Is it illegal to access an open Wi-Fi network? Hands up to those of you who believe it is illegal to access an open Wi-Fi network. Any country. 
any country, is it illegal to access an open Wi-Fi network without authorization? <clears throat> yes, it is. It's illegal to access an open Wi-Fi network without the consent of the owner. I'm amazed. Wow. Okay. But this is the kind of information that I found out that I didn't know while doing research for this particular talk. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Is it illegal to operate an open Wi-Fi network? Is it? Depends on what country you're actually in, it isn't illegal. Say, for example, here in Germany, I believe it is. It's frowned upon if you do not secure your Wi-Fi network. In the UK, in Canada, in the US, it isn't. You can actually operate a Wi-Fi network that's open without any issues at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, take this with a little bit of pinch of salt. I'm not a, I'm just an engineer. I'm not a, I'm not completely adverse in all the laws and the implications around the world of where it's actually applied and where it isn't. This is just, you know, one man's interpretation. And the reason why it's kind of illegal is it's called Wi-Fi piggybacking, which is basically unauthorized access to a computer network. Okay? It's not allowed. <laughs> I even hear excuses, and I've read excuses that, you know, even if you have no harmful intent, you're just checking your email. You're still breaking the law, technically. Yeah? Even if the SSID said it was free, you're still breaking the law. Even if the, even though the Wi-Fi operates on an unlicensed spectrum, you know, they don't own that RF. He's still breaking the law. And you can be prosecuted. And here's a wonderful case. This is brilliant. A guy called Sam Peterson. He was sat in his car outside a coffee house checking his emails. And a BDI police officer came over to him and said, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? I'm checking my emails. And so the BDI officer went off. And he said, no, nah, I'm not having that. He went and found the law that prosecuted that guy for surfing the internet, for checking his emails, accessing the local cafe illegally, and he got done, he got charged, and he got done $400 fine, 40 hours community service. Crazy, huh? <sighs> Absolutely crazy. So it kind of got me thinking about, you know, if all this kind of stuff goes on, how could I protect myself and you from accessing an open Wi-Fi network? Anyone, any ideas? How could it protect you? Don't use open networks. Don't use open networks, okay. That's one obvious one. But we need to have an open Wi-Fi network, OK? How can, how, how can I protect you? VPN. VPN. OK, well, technically, what is, it, what is the definition of an open network? No authentication. No authentication. So anyone come across it? terms and conditions, accept to use policy? So that's what grants you permission to actually access a Wi-Fi network. You're signing up for the T's and C's. And it's presented by a captive portal. So although you're not actually doing any type of um, encryption or anything else, you're kind of authenticating yourself against a captive portal. So that's where they come into play. They've got their uses. So make sure you read the terms and conditions as well. Because your personal data can be sold on, believe it or not. And th th there's also something that I read about which is really, really good. Has anyone heard of the Herod Clause at all? Well, basically, the Herod Clause was what they did um, in London, they did a bit of an experiment, and basically they um, put out free Wi-Fi, and they put a, an unreasonable condition that six people signed up to. And it was basically that they would um, agree to assign their first char firstborn child for the duration of eternity. <laughs> Some people, huh? <clears throat> and here's an example. In my superstore in my town, exactly, of a captive portal that's asking me for my mobile number, and it's going to give my personal details it's going to share and pass on to all the subsidiaries and groups associated with that particular company. And that's something that I don't really want. Do you? So the other question is we had about, well, without the need of having a captive portal, what about if we actually are on the premises? What if we've actually bought the coffee and they're offering free Wi-Fi? That grants us permission to access their Wi-Fi network, believe it or not. <clears throat> no captive portals required. We can connect and go. Easy peasy. So I've got another question. Who gets prosecuted if a user on that open Wi-Fi network in that coffee house, who gets prosecuted if they committed a felony? So they did a copyright infringement, downloaded an illegal movie. Who gets prosecuted? Sorry. Question. OK, so, I was, so, so they've got three options. You've got the ISP, the Wi-Fi provider, or the actual user. Okay, interesting debate. Okay, so not everyone's clear. 
<clears throat> the Wi-Fi provider, they're the sole responsible for their Wi-Fi content, not the user, because who the hell is he? How the hell is he going to track? If it was me doing the illegal activity, how are you going to track me? The ISPs are actually covered by a mere conduit law and an ISP safe harbor law um, in the US. So as long as they're not tampering with the data and the packets that are traversing their networks, they're immune, so they're okay. So that's all great and well. But the problem that we have, actually, believe it or not, with Wi-Fi providers and why they're banged to rights is based on the fact that we're talking about negligence and liability. And it's really, really interesting because there are well-known proven cases of this. With direct liability, you did it. You downloaded that illegal movie, bang to rights. You've got no excuses. There's a second type of liability called contributory liability, whereas you know about it. You know it's happening, or even you aided it. You contributed. You gave, I, I gave you the URL to go and download that illegal movie. You've got vicarious liability as well, where you profit from that. So by everyone in this hotel downloading illegal content, supplying the bar, the restaurant, we're paying customs. So they can be done for vicarious liability because they could prevent this. They could secure their open Wi-Fi network, but they've chosen not to. Negligence, if they can't do on their liability, they'll try to do on negligence. And what that's saying is basically you have a duty of care to secure that Wi-Fi network connection. So here's an example I like to give. How many of us get up for work in the morning? It's cold. We get in the car, turn the car on, put the, put the heating right up, and we jump back in the house, give it five, ten minutes, finish up our cup of tea. I do that. But what if I come back out and go, dude, where's my car? Are the insurance company going to pay me when I make a claim to say someone stole my car? No, because the insurance company is going to deem I'm negligent. I had a duty of care to look after my vehicle, and I didn't. No different with Wi-Fi networks. So a couple of final thoughts as to why captive portals have a vital role to play. We may not like them, but they're here. For now, they're here to stay until, <laughs> until things are clear. The law isn't clear. There's an open debate. There's a war raging on the internet about who's negligent and who isn't. Once that's been made clear, we'll have a better idea. To prevent themselves, Wi-Fi providers can actually implement acceptable use policies. That clears them. That shows they demonstrated you know, the will to try to prevent copyright infringement on their Wi-Fi network. So having a connect and go Wi-Fi network, you know, it's a risk, you know. So we as engineers need to advise our customers of those particular risks because they exist. There's no getting around it. You know, you need to trust your, trust your users. So one of the things in this one, especially for Keith, I asked these guys at Disney because they open, they offer an open Wi-Fi network for anyone that's been. I asked them. I said, hey guys, how can you do this when there's the liability, there's the negligence? How do we get around it? I'm still in conversations with them, but this is what they basically said, that they basically believe in not having captive pools because it's a barrier. And I think we all agree to that, okay? Um, I'm having further discussions with them about the negligence and the liability cases, but some of that I'm, I'm afraid I can't disclose too much. But these guys do it, and they're a billion dollar industry, for God's sake, so if they can do it, why can't everywhere else do it? So, just finally, I know I'm over time, but there was so much to get through. So <clears throat> I think I found the perfect captive portal, and this is just my interpretation. Um, there it is. I'm only joking. I've actually thought of a concept with how could we actually still provide open Wi-Fi, net open Wi-Fi networks without penalizing the users? How do we get the user's permission to access that Wi-Fi network? And also without penalizing the Wi-Fi provider. And it's the concept of parking your car at a public venue. When we park a car, the owners of that venue accept no responsibility for your car that's damaged, if it's stolen, and it runs over an infant. They're not going to accept any liability for that, even though there is crimes being committed. So the concept is, why can't we have this sticker on the front of the hotel that says, Wi-Fi is free in here, but you connect at your own risk. You're liable for any content that you illegally download. You know, it's just a concept, it's just an idea, but I want to throw it out there and say you know, that this could work. Um, there's references on this particular presentation. This is where I've been, and this is where I've done my research, and I've had a look. So everything that I've actually spoken to about today is actually all in there. So you know, feel free, fill your boots, and have a look, um, and everything else. But thanks very much for listening. All right, thank you.